Mrs. Allen, forget it. There's no hope. Everybody stand one more time. We'll give Hannah dispensation. Can we get the kneeling face? Three hours. She's so swollen right now. We give her the blessing. Take it easy, right? Well, Father God, I just thank you for this wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Father God, we just come before you ready to hear your word. Father, let the, the seed be planted deep in our heart. Let it be an encouragement and reminder to us today. Let something click in our minds and let us be encouraged in what you did for us at the cross. Let us walk out of here changed even if just a little bit today encouraged and built up in our inner man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a, a, actually a quite simple message. I'm not, I can't do part two of the eschatology because today's Easter, so I forgot last week that it was Easter. I know you're all disappointed, but Joanne had asked for me to preach something about the cross today because she said she doesn't understand it all. So, um, so what we're going to do... <laughs> That's right, yeah. So what, what we're going to do is... Now, to talk about the cross, there is so much that God did at the cross and was accomplished. You literally could have a year's worth of messages to talk about every single thing that was accomplished at the cross. But I just want to take, I just felt led to take a little snapshot of one portion. And uh, I want to just thank uh, Joanne for reminding me of this part this week. And so, oh, I, I also want to thank our DJs. Let's give a clap for Billy and Clint. Yeah, and they got a groupie, but that's okay. That's what happens. <laughs> Groupies happen. I mean, let's just face it. So let's talk about the cross. Anybody want to talk about the cross since we're a Christian church? Eight hours. But we'll serve lunch in a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 I got you. I got what you're saying. So the cross is where the progressive plan of God and redemption had all at one time met at this moment in time, right? So everything past, present, future as concerned with the sinfulness of man and there was things that happened in, in heaven itself that all happened in that weekend. And so what I want to talk about today is two things, is the five barriers between man and God. So there's five barriers. And number two, the results of the reconciliation. In other words, how God overcame those barriers or shattered those barriers so uh, he could have a relationship with us and restore mankind to his original plan for our creation. How many know that God had an original plan for us? And how many know the way the world now is not it? Amen? And so there's five barriers there's the barriers of the holiness of God, and Brother Sal touched upon this in his reading today. There's the state of sin, which Brother Sal touched upon today. There's the penalty of sin, which Brother Sal touched upon today. There was spiritual death. Interestingly, Brother Sal touched upon that one. And you wouldn't believe this. There's a, a barrier of unrighteousness, and it just so happens, Brother Sal touched upon that one today. Amen? Way to go, Sal. The only competition I have is John is dressed really nice today. <laughs> So we're going to whip through these. Barrier number one, the holiness of God. So often when we think of God as love, which Sal touched upon today, which he is, but more is said in the Bible of God's holiness than God's love, which Sal touched upon today. In fact, Isaiah 57, 15 even declares that his name is holy. In Isaiah 6, 3, the holy cherubim continuously proclaim the holiness of God. 
And after seeing this in the vision of God's absolute holiness given to the prophet Isaiah, he cried out, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah, when he got into the presence of God, what happened? He had a conviction of his unrighteousness. God hadn't said a word to him. Did God say you're a bad man? It was a natural conviction that he had as soon as he got into the presence of the 100% the holiness. Amen? And so John wrote this, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So we understand that light and dark mean is talking about our moral uh, attributes there. Light is goodness and righteousness and holiness, and darkness is evil and sin and selfishness and all the bad stuff. So Abraham confessed God as judge of all the earth, who had to act in accordance with his holy justice. And in 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul called God the righteous judge. These and many other passages point to the perfect holiness of God and stress the fact that God cannot and will not act contrary to his holy character, as Brother Sal told us this morning. If he is without injustice and completely righteous in all that he, had done, he is and does, how can man have fellowship with perfect holiness as we are sinful? Right? So there's two branches of God's holiness is there's perfect righteousness and perfect justice, which Brother Sal talked about today. God is absolute righteousness and perfection. It is impossible for God to do anything wrong or to have fellowship with anything less than his perfect righteousness. Since God is also perfectly just, he acts in accordance with his perfect righteousness. He cannot be partial or unfair to any creature he must deal with. The creature is perfect in perfect justice. So that, this means all that is unrighteous or sinful must be judged and separated from him. And I think Satan knew this when he caused man to fall in the garden. One of the things Satan tried to do is, is when, he get man, when he got man to fall, he knew that the righteousness of God and the justice of God would have to act against mankind, and he tried to get God to kill us all. Everyone see that? And so it's interesting that God, God had outsmarted them. There's a lot of scriptures there. You can go back and, and look up, but we're going to move forward to barrier number two. The state of sin. Right? The book of Galatians teaches us that man is shut up. What does it mean, shut up? It's not what you, what you tell your neighbor when they're really loud or talking bad about you. It means we're locked out or shut out from God. There's actually the barrier there. That's a barrier. Because man is under the eight ball of sin. Romans 3.23 declares that all have sinned and fallen short or missed the mark of the glory of God, which is his holy character. Even J.D. has, believe it or not. Sin creates a barrier between God and man which hinders access to God. And the barrier of sin is one of the reasons why God in his sovereign love gave his son to die on the cross for man's sin which Brother Sal talked about today. There are three aspects which go to make up the barrier of sin. Let's quickly go through all three. There's imputed sin. What's imputed sin? It's what happens when you make Dina angry. Oh no, that wasn't it? Romans 5.12 teaches us about imputed sin. Adam is the representative head of the human race, and because of our natural relationship to him, because we all have the DNA, right? His sin is passed down or imputed to us or reckoned to the entire human race. God views the human race as though we all sin in Adam or with Adam. When you're born, you have the propensity and natural pull to sin. It's just the, that's what the Bible teaches. And I'll prove this to you. If you take... Uh, about six or seven five-year-olds don't let them eat breakfast or lunch and by two o'clock sit them in a circle around the table and put three cookies out you'll see sin going into play right there it's going to be survival of the fittest right 
They're going to punch, kick, and pull, and the strongest kid may end up with all three cookies because that's the way it goes. And so, you know, sin, you, you could, any parent who, who, who has young ones know that there's folly bound up in hearts of children. Amen? At least in my house there was, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Romans 5, 12 through 18 says this, For just as Adam's sin was imputed to every human being, say every human being, every human being as a descendant of Adam because of Adam's one act of sin. Now here's the, here's the deal. So Christ's righteousness is imputed to all who become children of God by faith in Christ because of his one act of righteousness. So as such, Adam was a type of Christ. So all who believe, just the way Adam sinned and we inherit his sin, you inherit Jesus' righteousness when you believe. Do you feel it? No. You don't feel it. Do you see it? No, you have to believe it by faith because God's word says so. Right, JR? Right. So then we talk we'll talk about the second is inherited sin. Inherit, the Bible teaches that uh, the fact that the, in the posterity of Adam, every child is born with the sinful nature that we inherit from our parents. Many passages of Scripture refer to this principle, right? Ephesians 2, 1, and 3, all, say all, all are dead in sin and are by nature. That doesn't mean we're good people doing bad things. It means by nature we were the children of wrath. Our very inward nature was sinful and is under the wrath of God. That's a hard thing to accept and that's one of the, that's one of the struggles people have with rejecting Christianity because religion will tell you, you're pretty good, you just got to need to work through some things. And so religion will teach you this pattern of self-righteous works to make yourself better. Well, we know under the law, no one got saved under the law. So we needed something that transcended the law. We need something that transcended our unrighteous state. Amen? We need something that transcended the wrath of God towards us, as Brother Sal told us today. You like that, don't you? It's true, though. He gave this message. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 58.3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. The, the, these who speak lies go astray from birth. So the vital principle is that men do not sin and become sinners. Rather, they sin because they are sinners. It is our flesh's natural propensity into sin. I speak for authoritatively on this, right? If when my flesh gets a hold of my mind, bad things go through my mind, right? You know, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that experiences that, except for maybe Robin. But other than that, and Mrs. Allen. But other than that, you know, I gotta put I gotta put Aunt Charlotte, and Miss Jean, with that too, because they've never done anything wrong. <laughs> So that's an important principle that, uh, again, the, the word the Bible uses, fancy word Greek, homo logeo. It means to come into agreement with God. And so we come into agreement with God that we sin and we're bound to sin. You know, man's pride don't like that. We don't like to say that we're bad boys and girls. We like to think of ourselves as good boys and girls. But if you sin once... You've broken the whole thing and the wrath of God stands against you. That's the way the, the legal aspect of God works. A lot of people don't realize that, that God is, there's, there's a lot of aspects to God and one thing, he is a righteous judge. There's a legal aspect in heaven that had to be dealt with. Amen? And then the individual or personal sin. This refers to the products of the sinful nature of inherited sin. The actual deeds or acts of sin which all men do because they are sinful. Who, who sins in here? Come on, Dina, get your hand up. 
At least John's, John's honest there, and, and Brian, they got both hands up. You like that, huh? I'm an interactive pastor. I like to interact with the crowd a little bit. Is that okay, John? I like you know, it's, it's fun being a pastor because there's so many things that people judge you on. Either people think you're this holy man and that you're unapproachable or they're intimidated to be around you. Uh, I had uh, one of the gentlemen said, well, you're different than me because you're a pastor. And, you know, you're at a higher position with God. I said, sir, that is error. <laughs> Or you get lumped into all the sins of, and, and, and the bad preachers. So, you know, people get burned by preachers all the time. There's a lot of bad ones out there. You know, we make mistakes too. We're humans. And so then you're judged by, well, pastor so-and-so is a lousy pastor, so all pastors are bad. And so when I'm out working my job and I'm out in the world working, I don't tell people I'm a pastor because I just don't want that whole thing to come in between uh, you know, there's a few people I do as the Lord opens it, but it, it's in no means am I ashamed, but I just don't want it to ruin the relationship. And in this day and age, people are like, oh, you're too holy or you're a jerk because, you know, pastor so-and-so on TV rip people off. So you're probably trying to rip people off. And there's all kinds of these judgments you get. And so I deliberately go out of my way sometimes in public to be a little fun-loving. And uh, I love people, so that's the way it is. I'm not perfect, but I try. Anyways, that was my bunny trail. I'll ba back the rescheduled program. <laughs> Let's go to the third barrier. Because God is holy and man is sinful, now follow the logic here, God's perfect justice must act against man and charge him as guilty under the penalty of sin, and we have a sin debt. Everybody's got a sin debt before they come to the cross. And the sentence to serve, everyone's got a sentence. Thus the law of the Old Testament functions as a bill of indictment. Without a guilty verdict, there can be no grace. And it shows man that we're guilty under the penalty of sin. This is clear from the following passages. Joanne chapter 1, 4 says, oh, I mean Romans 3, 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. How, what part of the world? All the world. Because, listen to this, because by the works of the law, say it with me, no flesh will be justified in his sight. You hear that? Your Ten Commandment keeping is not going to save you. It's funny, like Christians preach a lot of these ministries, really pontificate the Ten Commandments. Did you know that, uh, 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 let's talk about the Sabbath real quick. Which day is the Sabbath? Saturday. Saturday. What's the rule of the Sabbath? Keep it holy. How, by how? Not working. No. Don't do anything. That means you can't turn on a light, make a meal, flush a toilet. You have to have your meals pre-made, and you do the you do the, the the law how they celebrate the Sabbath, and then you are to go sit down and contemplate God all day. If you lift a finger. There was a man who was cold and went into the woods and gathered sticks and built a fire for himself, and God said, you have to stone that man. Shocking. Last night was the first night of Passover. The Jewish religion. They fell on Passover. Mm-hmm. It was nothing but a lot of Jewish people working, cooking, cleaning. Exactly. And so God didn't change the Sabbath law. We don't have, there's nowhere in the Bible that says Sabbath light. There's nowhere that says, okay, guys, I'm not going to be as harsh. Just kind of just celebrate it. It doesn't say that the law cannot be altered, but it can be fulfilled. And so when these Christians say you've got to keep the Sabbath, all of them deserve to be stoned. They turned on a light switch. So we don't realize these laws are killers. Paul calls them the ministry of death written in stone, 2 Corinthians 3, 7. No man can be justified. The Ten Commandments never saved a soul. And then they say, well, after you're saved, then you keep the Ten Commandments. You go, you're back in circular logic. Then the Sabbath, you can't work. Right? 
and, and, and coveting. Paul said in Romans 7 that the, the covetousness would come out of him and it would kill him every time he read the commandment. He says, oh, look, I don't want to covet. And then I would read the commandment and I would start to covet. And he was in a circle. It's a, it's a wheel of death, I call it. It's the hamster wheel. It's to teach you to one conclusion. You can't earn salvation. Amen? And so, let's move on. Galatians 3.19, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. The law would have never came if there was no sin. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise has been made. Who's the seed? That's right. Galatians 3.22, But the scripture has shut up all men under sin by the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who... All right, Colossians 2.14, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, the Old Testament law, and which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having it nailed to the cross. Where was the law nailed? In Jesus' body. The, his body was literally the veil, and the veil was rent, and the blood was effectual in cleansing us from sin. It was the only sacrifice that could work. The certificate of debt, right, refers to his law and its indictment, which is death. We have a debt to pay. But the thing which must be understood is that the debt was so great that man himself cannot pay it by religion, good deeds, or morality. You can't be a good person. There's no such thing. Because if you sin once in your life, even the cute old lady who, uh, who s uh, makes her, what do you call it, or sews her little things, I've heard them very ladies cuss people out, so you got to watch them, right? We're all in prison to sin, and we can't, be, we can't be good enough. The very best that a man can come up with or fall short of the glory of God. Man is dead, incapacitated to, or in, his sinful condition, which Brother Sal told us today. As further byproduct... Of these three parts of the barrier, there's two others that will automatically occur because of these and compound the problem. And it's not that Larry Peabody's not home today. But it's close. He should be home. I'm mad about that. How'd they take him on Easter? Man. Paul teaches us that in Adam all die, 1 Corinthians 15.22. Man's position in Adam brings spiritual death and eventually uh, physical death and ultimately eternal death or eternal separation from God. You see, when the serpent told Eve, you shall surely die, and then she didn't drop right dead when she ate the apple, Adam was like, she didn't drop dead. I guess God was telling a fib, but he didn't realize the death wasn't necessarily right now. It was a slow death. Didn't think of that one, right? Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. It's the awesome consequence of sin. The point is, is that death, whether physical or spiritual, is a product of man's position in Adam and his own personal sin. And I'm going to be talking more about this next week when we go back to our eschatology. We're going to do a little study of Romans chapter 8, which all about is, is the flip side of this, how Christ undid it all. So this means that man in himself is without spiritual life and spiritual capacity. Now, if that is true, now let's assume that that's true, right? As believers, we believe that it's true. Imagine all the, the religions of the world, man's self-effort. Because all religions have one thing in common. It's the do-to-become system. You've got to do the five tenets of Islam to get saved. You've got to do the meditations in Buddhism to try to reincarnate yourself to a better place and work your way over thousands of years to nirvana. And then you have Hindu, which they've got to do the sacrifices to all the various idols. It's all due to become. This one sticks out like a sore thumb. 
Because Christ is the opposite of that. It's a believe and you are. He did it all, right? And so think about this. All those people in other religions are starting out from a place of unrighteousness, and they're all under the penalty of sin, and they're trying to work their way out of it, but they can't. So every religion is, is coming to a dead end. You've got to do it over and over and over. You never get to a place where you're righteous. You know, I'll take, for instance, in, um, like in Islam, why, do, why does in strict Islam or fundamental Islam do women have to wear burqas? What is the reason? Can anyone tell me why women have to wear burqas? So they don't arouse, arouse the men. So they don't arouse the men. Think about that for a second. <laughs> so because men can't control themselves, women have to live in a literal tent and sweat to death all the time in 110 degrees because men can't control themselves. If they took their burqas off, the men couldn't control themselves. So is the sin problem stopped? It's not solved by the flesh. It's powerless. Paul tells us in Colossians, all those rules and regulations are powerless to bring about God's righteousness. Can't do it. <clears throat> And so I feel so bad that the, the, the self-torture that people do to themselves, trying to make themselves right with God. And it's not for a lack of effort. It's not for a lack of effort. You know, I knew one guy from college that got into uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and he would sit there and do the chakras for six hours a day. And he never got any better in his life. Still was sleeping with women, left and right, and all this stuff. And I'm like... Not working out too well, is it? Hasn't changed the sin nature. Still did selfish things. Still would cuss you out. Oh, but I got to go do the chakra now and get it off. And then right back to the same dead end. Because it doesn't change. Now, Christianity, as you walk it out, should bear the fruit of change. Guess what? When I got saved, I stopped doing drugs. I stopped fornicating. I stopped boozing myself. I stopped carousing and partying. And I started bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I started being a, a decent person. I slowly stopped being selfish and started being selfless over time. And I'm over time, I'm changing from the inside out. Not because I'm following rules. It's because I'm cultivating uh, and co-laboring with the Holy Spirit that was given to me as my internal ability to be righteous. Amen? And so it's important we understand that in Christianity, but at the same time, Christianity gets nullified when you start doing all the rules and regulations all the time. There's a time and place for that, of course, but that's not the way we get justified, is it? So that is why we have to be born again, Jesus said. He came to the conclusion, right? Nicodemus came, he says, you must be born again. Of course, Nicodemus is thinking in the natural, like, how am I going to fit my mother's womb? I mean, holy cow, he literally, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's some spiritual stuff right there, but that just goes to show you, without the Holy Spirit, we don't understand things of the Spirit. Amen? And so, so man was not only separated from God by sin, by God's holy character, and by the penalty of sin, but he faced the problem of spiritual death and the need of spiritual life. Being spiritually dead, man needs spiritually life and eternal life, which can only come through the new birth and a new position in Christ as our source of life. Let's go further. The last barrier. Unrighteousness. The prophet Isaiah wrote, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. You hear that? Think about our religious efforts without, apart from Christ. Filthy rags is the best place you could get to. And all of us, whether like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind, take us away. Quoting Psalm 14, 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul exclaims that it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. Apart from Christ, there's not a single righteous person. Amen? In order for people to have a fellowship with God, they must have a standing, a righteousness equal with God because of their condition, dead in sin. They can never establish a, righteous, a righteousness sufficient to pass the righteous judgment of God. Amen? We talked about the error of typical religion or religious people. I try not to be religious. 
You have to be very careful because it's easy to become religious. That's why I try to keep it real in here because it's very easy to slip into the whole cultural Christianity, uh, I call it Christian Rules and Principles, C-R-A-P. Use it to figure out the acronym yourself. I like that. That one. <laughs> Christian Rules and Principles. Are there principles we should live by? Absolutely. Is there rules? I would say there is. But we don't justify ourselves by them. They're goals that we attain through our progressive sanctification. And you're not going to have it together all at once. You start here, and God very well will take you as where you're at, and you grow over time as you walk by the Spirit. You take one step, he'll take the other. You take the next step, he takes the other. And you grow, sometimes slow, but you grow. Unlike Mrs. Peabody, she just got it all together at once. I can't figure out how she did it. But she did. So, let's move on. The solution is God's work of grace in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This work of grace is called reconciliation. Everyone say reconciliation. reconciliation. Here's the cause of it. Jesus Christ uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God says he made him to be sin for us that we might be made the... How many know that you have a perfect righteous position spiritually? It may not be fully manifest in your outward behavior, but this is something you have to believe. You don't see this. People, I know a lot of people, and I struggled with this for years, because when I screw up, the devil condemns you, right? Anyone ever had that happen? Yeah. Right? And so you get condemned in something, and then you get pulled away, and you get condemned, and you get pulled away, and then you get mad, and all kinds of this other stuff, and the devil's whispering in your ear, you know, you're lousy, and then sometimes you get mad. Well, you're not like them Christians. Or they're, they're just know-it-alls, right? And so the, all kinds of things happen to you. But the truth is, you have to believe to your inner man with everything that you have. This is one of the most important things to believe, that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That is a positional bedrock truth. Until you're established in that, you'll never get to second base in your Christian walk. You have to understand that you have his positional righteousness. Amen? Despite despite outward manifestations of sin that still come out of you. You have that positionally. It's unshakable. It's, it, you didn't do it. God did it. Remember, the new covenant is also between Jesus and the Father. He's the keeper of the covenant. It, it, was, it was the Father gave him that covenant, and then he gives it to us. Amen? Amen. So the results of reconciliation are threefold. We're going to close with this. The removal of the barrier, positional sanctification, and justification. These are, now remember, there's about 200 things that happen at the cross, but we're just kind of skimming across one area of, of importance. So number one, the removal of the barrier. The penalty of sin, spiritual death, everything we talked about there. For he himself, this is for the believer now, he himself is our peace, having made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. What's an enmity? Is that? No, not quite. An enemy. Who said that? Narish, you're the winner. It's an enemy or something that stands against you. Here's the shocking truth. What was the enemy that stood against us here? The law. Really? Look, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by having it put to death the... What's the enmity? The law. The law. The law stood against us. 
Why? Because it was a guilty verdict. Says, yes, ma'am. And then he also means opposition and hatred. So when you think of it that way, it's, it's more than just, you know, the enemy. It's that, that power, that emotion, you know, those forces that are behind it. Very good. See, my, my wife is very smart. She doesn't talk a lot, but when she does, she drops truth bombs. I just get out of the way from the repercussions. Let's keep going in the scriptures. <laughs> and he came to preach pre peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we have both, we have our access in one spirit to the Father. So the law that gave us our guilty verdict had to be fulfilled, completed, and taken away. And the propitiation, which Brother Sal talked about today, God took our sin. Amen? And it results in, number two, positional sanctification and perfect standing. Now remember, there's two aspects of your sanctification. There's your position and there's experiential. Your experiential, you walk out, you grow into. It's called spiritual maturity. But by position, it's, it's perfect. And I'll, and I'll show you Romans 5, 1. Therefore, and when we see therefore, having been, say been, that's past tense, right? Having been justified by faith, we have through our through whom also we have obtained, we have obtained, say I have obtained, this is 100% you have obtained, our introduction by faith into this grace in which you now stand. You don't stand on the law. Romans 6.14, as Paul goes on, we are no longer under the law, we are under grace and we exult in the hope of the glory of God 2 Corinthians 5 1 therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creature the old things have passed and behold the new things have come and finally number three justification that means just as if you never sinned you've been declared righteous before God and now you're, you're able and blessed to hang out with Brent Peabody. Through Christ's righteousness imputed to us, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21 says this, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now when it says God was in Christ, that's talking about, it's not so much his locality, but he's talking about the plan. Like in other words, it's saying God's plan, which came about in Christ, right? Or Christ was his plan to accomplish this, because people will be like, well, Jesus wasn't God because God said he had to be in him right there in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 19. And no, it's talking about the plan there. Amen? So if you understand, if you understand the fact that Christ gave up all that he had and all that he was, God would have had to have been in him for him to walk out what he needed to walk out because he gave it all up. He left it yep. behind to come here as a man. Mm -hmm. He humbled himself that way. God needed to be with him to walk it out. That's right. So finally, we'll end with this slide. The results, and this ends after you're saved, after you're justified, after you're sanctified, you now have a calling. What is our calling? To be ministers of reconciliation. The ministers of reconciliation is only the pastor. It's only the evangelist. It's only Brian and Laura. It's only Joanne. It's all believe. Everybody put your hand in here. You're all ministers of reconciliation. Every believer is an ambassador of Christ and a minister of reconciliation. 
Since Christ died for us, we are each obligated to live not for ourselves, but for the Lord and to be his representatives in a world that is alienated from God. Amen? Some good encouragement. Some rem how many know we have to remind ourselves of these things? I preach myself the gospel a lot. Sometimes I'm like, I've got to remember I'm justified. Amen? Got to remember I'm sanctified. Amen? When you're having a tough day, I said, you know, I have hope. I can get through this. And you have to remind yourself. Paul says, teach and remind them of these things. And so a lot of times, I know theology can get really deep and expansive, and I love that stuff, but there's a certain thing where you just got to keep reteaching it, reminding, rereading, talk about it over and over. Because how many know it takes a lot to get into your thick skin? Some of us harder than others. <laughs> I had to fall off the bike maybe three, four times. <laughs> That's why I don't get on a motorcycle, because I'm afraid I'll fall off. <laughs> I'm not as skilled as, as J.R. and Neil in that department. Each, each has his own gift, right? Any questions or comments as we close? Anything, Mrs. Allen? You have a scripture you want to share or anything? No? Anything, Wilbur? Do you have a song you want to close with? Because, of course, the DJ has to have the last word. How I many know oh, the DJ always has the last word? Amen?